Welcome everyone to our last webinar of 2019. I cannot believe it. Um, my name is Priscilla Rader. I'm the Education Coordinator for the Animal Legal Defense Fund. And thank you so much for joining us for our last webinar for this year. And we are so excited about what's in store for 2020. Uh, we are going to be moving to a new platform form that will allow for us to do a lot more with these webinars. We'll be doing difficulty levels, uh, different web multi-course webinars for uh, advocacy, uh, those who work in advocacy, law, pro uh, law professors, law students, attorneys, and everyone in between. So please do uh, keep a lookout for that. We will be sending out more information, especially to our webinar fans, those who are with us all the time. We really appreciate your support and please do take the survey at the end of this webinar. So for the final uh, webinar of 2019, we thought it would be fun to look back at all the successes and victories that we've had. So with me today is the always lovely Stephen Wells, our executive director of the Animal Legal Defense Fund. And we added a special guest. I'm very thrilled to have senior staff attorney with us, Christina Stella. So they'll be walking through some of those victories, giving some stories. We will have a Q&A at the very end of the webinar, and then we'll wish you well, and we'll see you next year. So I'll just pass it over to Steve and Christina. Hi, thanks a lot for that, Priscilla. And uh, as Priscilla said, I'm Stephen Wells, Executive Director of the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and joining me is Christina Stella, who is a senior staff attorney in our litigation program. So she gets to do fun things like sue animal abusers, mm -hmm. which is really one of our favorite things to do. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that happened through 2019. This is kind of a, a year-end retrospective a bit, but we also wanna mix it up and talk about uh, some sort of things essential to running ALDF, like um, how we choose our cases, um, how we plan and all those sorts of things. So along the way, we'll tell some, some backstory to how some cases came about and also what they mean in the big, bigger picture. So hope that's helpful to you. It's a little different than the usual uh, webinar format we use, but we thought this would be uh, interesting for folks. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Animal Legal Defense Fund, our mission is to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals through the legal system. And that's really what makes ALDF unique is that all of our work is exclusively focused on the law and le legal pathways to change. Um, so we have, uh, we work in all areas of the law, legislation, criminal justice, of course, litigation um, and programs in the law schools. But we're gonna focus mostly on some of our litigation cases and having Christina with us, she can give us uh, some insights and first person accounts um, and then, uh, but I hope to touch on some of the other uh, wonderful programs that we have as well. Um, so I wanna start with uh, probably the question I get asked more than any other is uh, how do we choose our cases and how do we decide on what things to focus on? Um, and the reality is that sadly, uh, there's no shortage of things we could be focusing on. Um, so we do have a pretty robust planning process um, and it works on the, we, we do a strategic plan every three years. So we take a deep dive and look at what's happening in the world, what changes in the law have happened, um, of course, what's happening with animals and where we see our most uh, opportunities for change that will be meaningful and impactful. Um, and then every year from that three-year plan, we make annual business plans. So really, what are we gonna accomplish this very year? And that goes across all of our programs. Um, but what we're mostly looking for, of course, is impact. So we're looking at uh, what is the number of animals that whose lives we can impact by the work that we do? Um, where can we challenge the absolute worst forms of cruelty, uh, for example? Um, uh, where is there uh, opportunity to set legal precedent? And we'll talk a little bit about setting legal precedent and how you move the law forward. Um, and then the, we're looking for ways to challenge one of the fundamental problems for animals that we'll also talk a little bit more about. And that is that, uh, unfortunately, our laws still classify animals as property, 
uh, more like things like the chairs we're sitting on than uh, living sentient animals. So that presents some challenges. And maybe you can speak to that in terms of like standing for cases, how, how that impacts. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, most lawyers, I think, are able to just represent their clients in court, you know, and just walk right into the courthouse and sue to protect or vindicate um, their interests or their rights. And because of the way that animals are viewed under the law, um, as property, even though in some cases they have legal rights, or in lots of cases they have legal rights, but they don't have a way to kind of vindicate them for themselves. Um, in other cases, they don't have, you know, the full scope of legal rights, uh, which includes the ability to, you know, to go to court um, and to sue on their own behalf and, um, you know, to protect their own interests just for their own sake and not because of how, you know, harm to animals implicates humans or, you know, other types of interests. Um, so that is a big challenge that we face in all of our cases across the board and something that, like you said, we're always looking for opportunities to um, to change that and to um, advance their status under the law. Yeah, it's kind of a root problem uh, for doing the kind of work we do is the difficulty in getting the animal's case before the courts. Um, and of course, most of you have heard, uh, you know, famously, I think, in uh, Mitt Romney said in one of the, erect, uh, the elections about um, corporations are people too. Uh, he didn't say it quite correctly, but uh, indeed corporations are persons under the law for some purposes, as are uh, cities and ships and some other inanimate objects. Um, and essentially that's, be, that's done so that those entities can engage with the legal system and can file, uh, be part of contracts and protect their interests and so forth. Yet animals uh, who live and breathe and uh, feel pain and all those sorts of things are, are denied uh, similar opportunities to, to be represented in court. Um, I was going to uh, uh, talk a little bit more about our planning process, um, but I guess uh, I want to get into some of the issues we're talking about. So I will say for the past two years, two of our prime areas of focus have been uh, farm, farmed animals, and factory farming and captive wildlife. And so those are two areas, uh, obviously factory farming is by far the largest number of animals uh, involved um, and arguably the worst kinds of cruelty, the most suffering. Mm -hmm. um, so naturally we're, we're uh, spending significant resources on combating that. And then with captive wildlife, we've seen some real opportunities to change the laws. It's a, uh, um, it's a really under-regulated field where people can buy and sell animals and keep them in really horrific conditions. And regulatory agents, as is too often the case, are not doing a good job of protecting them. So we've been able to step in uh, to do that. But let's jump in and talk about uh, factory farming first. Um, so uh, maybe you can talk about, uh, and I should say that Christina came to LDF um, already a litigator fighting the good fight, uh, mm -hmm. working uh, at Food and Water Watch, um, which is a great organization that we have occasionally partnered with. Um, and maybe you can talk about your experiences with animal agriculture um, and the environment as well as animals. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so pretty much fighting against factory farms and trying to protect animals trapped in that system has been the focus of my career from the beginning. I've been involved in food systems for a long time even before becoming a lawyer. Um, but the factory farming industry is really at the intersection of so many issues that are really important, like government accountability and corporate accountability and uh, uh, worker protection and public health and all of these really important things. Um, and so at ALBF, we're lucky enough to be able to um, focus exclusively on these issues um, from an animal's perspective and making sure that the animals who are trapped in the system and really suffer the most, as you said, um, are protected. And so, you know, the animal agriculture industry is really characterized first and foremost by extreme concentration, which requires animal abuse to take place in lots of different ways. I mean, just the practices that you know, the, the physical structures that can find the animals are abusive enough, but then in order to keep animals in that system long-term requires lots of um, you know, pumping them full of drugs and um, all kinds of things that then create behavioral right. issues that then require you know, interventions, aka abuse, to, um, to try to fight against. 
And so it's just a really, really horrible system for animals. And like you said, so many are, are trapped in it. Um, and then, you know, there's also these kind of incidental, although very fundamental um, effects of um, industrial animal ag, which are the environmental effects, not just in terms of pollution. I mean, it's a hugely polluting industry. It's responsible for, um, I actually have some statistics because I always forget them and they're really powerful. Um, it's responsible for 9% of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, the ag sector as a whole, and then 30% of that comes from livestock production. And the top five meat and dairy companies emit more greenhouse gases than the top three um, fuel and gas companies. So it's a huge wow. driver of mm -hmm. climate change, greenhouse gas production, all of these things. And then that's just kind of on the output side. It also pollutes water and leads to lots of, you know, effluents and pollutants being um, leaked into our waterways in lots of ways. Um, but then it also requires a ton of input. So it uses so much more water than, you know, plant-based production, for example, uh, plant-based dairy production. Um, and so that's another, you know, that's a driver of climate change, but also even more relevant in this climate change crisis that we're in as these um, factory farms are really eating up our resources as they're becoming more scarce. So a huge problem. <laughs> yeah, and, and so these, um... You know, we, we examine these kinds of things because uh, obviously the Animal Legal Defense Funds, our clients are the animals um, and the animals in factory farms uh, need us perhaps more than any other. Um, but it can be difficult, as we talked about up front, to directly represent their interests in court. A lot of people don't realize that uh, farmed animals um, are denied any federal legal protections while they're being raised in these uh, horrible nightmarish factory farms. Um, and most states have essentially exempted them from the state cruelty laws as well. So they've written, uh, you know, our laws have, have given a free pass to the ag industry um, and the horrendous suffering you see in these places as a result uh, is really evidence of that. Um, even in states where uh, cruelty laws do apply to farmed animals, what we see is, is pretty much no enforcement of those laws. So it's important that we're creative, and this is what we have to do uh, a lot of times, is be creative about how we get the case before court. And environmental laws are one way to do that, to go after the industry that's causing all this suffering and make them accountable for, for some of their um, societal ills. Absolutely. And luckily, environmental laws, as they exist now, although they're under threat, um, have something called citizen supervisions, which means that, you know, individuals don't need to wait for the government to act. They can go to court and represent the public interest or, in ALDS case, the interest of the animals being affected um, and, you know, surrounding communities. And so they're, they provide really important tools to, like you said, hold um, the corporations that perpetrate the abuse and pollution accountable, um, but also to make sure that the government is enforcing the laws that do exist. Um, so yeah, even though environmental law is often seen as kind of incidental to animal law in the realm of factory farming, it's really essential and provides a really powerful um, way of getting at the problems that there aren't other legal ways of addressing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it's also important to, to remember that um, other animals are harmed by factory farming right. as well. Um, factory farming is uh, extremely deleterious of wildlife um, and pollutes uh, rivers and other places that are essential homes for all kinds of life. Um, so really, it's also an assault on, on animals in the natural world as well. Um, so let's jump to uh, some of the some of the ways that we are addressing the problem of um, uh, factory farms. And one of the ways that we pioneered is um, challenging so-called ag-gag laws. Mm -hmm. um, and for those who don't know, ag-gag laws are a suite of laws that were passed um, by uh, agri the agriculture industry, essentially sought to pass laws that would gag the ability of people to uh, collect information, pictures, photos, videos of conditions on factory farms. Um, and this was really a response to an incredible uptick in the number of uh, exposés that were coming out, people getting on in these factory farms with cameras and coming out and showing just what a nightmare they are for animals. 
um, for workers too, for that matter, and for the environment. And uh, the response of the industry, um, as technology made it easier and easier to do that, uh, was to pass laws that essentially made it illegal uh, to take photos or videos on farms. Mm -hmm. And uh, so nine states had passed uh, these so-called ag-ag laws and uh, a coalition of environmental groups and animal protection groups like ALDF, um, as well as some uh, journalism groups that rely on undercover investigations. Also, this is a major threat and it's, uh, it's really a, a, a direct shot at our fundamental free speech rights. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we've been able to fend off most of the additional legislative efforts in passing new laws, not all, but most. Um, but ALDF decided we didn't want to let the ones that had passed stand. So uh, we started to challenge them and to take them to court. Uh, we started with uh, the state of Utah, um, followed by Idaho, and we have since won both those cases. Um, and then we continue, we have lawsuits against uh, currently pending against Arkansas, Kansas, North Carolina, and Iowa. Um, so, and those cases are still in court. Interestingly, we won Iowa, right. but then uh, <laughs> maybe you can tell the story, what yeah. happened. Yeah, so, right, Iowa, we do count Iowa as one of our victories. We won a lawsuit there in uh, January of this year, actually. Um, the law that Iowa had in place at the time prevented uh, or prohibited undercover investigators from making false representations on their job applications to gain employment at facilities where they would then conduct undercover investigations. So that law was struck down by the court in Iowa, uh, federal court in Iowa, as unconstitutional. And then three weeks later, the state legislature passed a second law uh, and basically responded directly to our case and what the court had said was unconstitutional about the first law. Um, so the state appealed our victory. So we're currently litigating the appeal right now uh, of the first law. And then we also filed suit immediately to challenge the second law because obviously we don't believe that the, that the new law, you know, corrected any of the unconstitutional <clears throat> deficiencies of the first law. Um, and so we just recently actually, last week or two weeks ago, um, won a preliminary injunction in our second case, which means that the state cannot enforce the new law um, until our lawsuit concludes. So we've had two victories in Iowa and we're still litigating it. And is that a sign in your experience that uh, the judge thinks we have a pretty strong chance of winning on the merits when we hit trial? Yes, definitely. That's part of the court's consideration is whether we have a uh, high chance of success ultimately on the merits when deciding whether to issue a preliminary injunction. So yes, it's a very good sign. We'll be very happy to beat <laughs> Iowa twice at that. Um, so yeah, so ag, ag is one way. Then we have uh, another thing that we've pioneered uh, working with a coalition of amazing uh, uh, animal protection and plant-based uh, uh, foods industry groups is to challenge uh, meat labeling laws. And this is a new phenomenon. You know. The investigations that have come out of factory farming in recent years that triggered the industry to want these ag ag laws to try and, you know, basically kill the messenger, um, really also helped spur a drive in plant based alternatives to animal products. And so, you know, all of us have seen, you know, there's now a, an impossible Whopper and there's a Beyond Burger at Carl's Jr. and on and on. And it seems like every day there's a new company make, making a new product that's vegan to replace uh, an animal product. Um, the traditional meat and dairy industry, which is a massive industry, I mean, people really don't understand what we're up against here. Uh, these are massive industries with deep pockets. Um, they don't like that. So once again, they're going to their friends in the state legislatures uh, and asking for laws, uh, essentially asking for unconstitutional laws uh, that in, it will be um, to stifle competition, essentially. And so what the way they're doing that, maybe you can talk about like sure. what exactly they're doing. Mm -hmm. So the two states where we're seeing this most strongly right now is in Missouri and in Arkansas. Um, so Missouri passed a law that basically prohibits, quote unquote, misrepresenting um, plant-based products as meat products if they're not actually derived from uh, animals. And so a violation of that statute carries up to 
um, a year in prison. It's a criminal statute. And then there's also a civil component that provides for a fine of $1,000 per violation. So obviously a company with you know tons of products out there on the shelves, marketing them every day um, can rack up tons and tons of um, fines in addition to um, being subjected to criminal penalties. And then in Arkansas, the law is really similar. It just there's It's just a civil law, not a criminal law, but um, it does the same thing. It prevents uh, plant-based meat purveyors from using words that are related to meat, like beef, pork, roast, sausage, things like that. Um, kind of these statutes were passed under the guise of protecting consumers from being confused. Like, yeah by these products, although uh, there's no evidence at all that we're aware of and that the state that the states were aware of at the time they passed these laws showing that consumers are actually deceived by these um, by these types of labels. And so we've sued in both states um, arguing, like you said, that there are you know unconstitutional <coughs> restrictions on speech. So yeah. that these you know companies can market their products in a way that appeals to consumers. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a comical, um, you know, representation of you know, trying to imagine somebody who's going out to buy their, you know, beef burgers or, you know, their their sliced uh, turkey slices and mistaking tofurkey um, or beyond meat, you know, that says plant based burger patty, you know, mm -hmm. in big letters. Um, but that's what they're trying to uh, to say. And unfortunately, they convinced the legislatures in Missouri, Arkansas. Uh, that this was a problem that they needed to address with new laws. So, um, so it falls to us and other groups. In the uh, Missouri case, we're very happy to be re representing um, Tofurkey, mm -hmm. and uh, we also have, I, I believe, the state ACLU. Is that right? In that case, I can't quite remember. I can't, it's, not, it's not. It's <laughs> not. It's not Christina's case. Um, we have a lot of attorneys in that program, but I believe that's right. Um, so, and, th and that's another important thing to say is that, you know, some of these issues, because they're of the breadth of them, uh, which Christina talked about, um, there's a lot of interested parties. In some of our ag gag suits, we were able to build coalitions with uh, journalism groups, uh, free press groups, uh, community groups. Uh, there one of our cases, uh, it may have been the Idaho case, we had a group. Uh, on board for a time that was representing uh, workers' rights, Latino workers' rights uh, specifically. Um, there are a lot of ills and a lot of impacts coming out of these places. So it's a great opportunity to uh, coalesce and you know work with, with other even non-traditional partners on these things and of course environmental groups and so forth. Um, we actually ALDF won a, uh, an award from uh, I will mess up the, the name, but it's a national uh, press organization um, and that gives out an award for uh, efforts to protect free speech. And we won that for our work on our ag ag cases. So we we're very honored by that. Um, another way that we uh, that we're looking at is so once again, the industry is recognizing that there's a shift in people's uh, interests as they become more aware of uh, the impacts to animals uh, on factory farms. Uh, people are making more humane choices. And um, one way the industry is responding is uh, not so much to change how they treat animals, but to change their labeling and advertising to make people think they are uh, treating their animals better than they actually are. Um, and this obviously is uh, it's injurious to consumers because um, you know they are probably paying a premium, thinking that they are taking some at least some small action to uh, to, to have animals treated better um, when they probably are not. Um, and it also you know it's it's a fairly cynical way to muddy the waters. Um, you know, if the industry can get everyone to think that it's all meaningless and it's all the same, mm -hmm. they kind of almost reach the same goal. So we, we see it as a pretty dangerous effort to dupe consumers, um, take their money dishonestly and so forth. So we have uh, filed numerous uh, false advertising or mislabeling cases over the years. A um, few recent ones we had, um, we had a case that was uh, the largest organic egg producer uh, here in Sonoma County, California. 
and uh, we had challenged them on their their labeling, which was showing um, you know, pictures of chickens out in the beautiful barnyard and inside. It talked about how they're being raised in the gorgeous uh, Sonoma Valley, and uh, in fact, they were being kept in these giant uh, metal warehouses, um, as most chickens uh, raised for for meat are or for for eggs are. Um, so, uh, with that, we took them to court and eventually won and the labels had to be changed and they, they had a third party, um, certifier now go in to look at conditions and, uh, we made some other changes. So these, these cases can be effective and it's a way to keep, uh, keep this industry honest. Uh, and I remember cause it's local. Um, and, you know, friends of mine, uh, I'm a vegan, so I don't eat eggs, but uh, some of my friends who did were just horrified. They're, no, not Judy's eggs, because <laughs> um, they were buying those. Um, and we also, we sued uh, Trader Joe's over its labeling of its eggs for similar reasons. And uh, I believe they settled that case mm -hmm. and changed the labels. Um, and we're in a battle with Hormel. Uh, over a, a particular product that it's selling um, that we believe is uh, mislabeled and misleading consumers about uh, uh, care and treatment of animals as a result. Um, and then most recently, we, uh, we filed a lawsuit against a company some of you may have heard of called Tillamook, um, which is a large dairy operation based up in Oregon. Uh, they mostly make cheese, mm -hmm. they're famous for their cheese. And uh, their ads, uh, go on one slide. No, no, go back, sorry. Yeah, okay, that's it. Um, if you're looking at the slides, you can actually see these, uh, these two photos were kind of emblematic. They were, they were pulled from uh, Tillamook advertising on the web. Um, you know, lots of hands-on care, family farms and so forth. Um, and I believe Tillamook did at one time start as sort of a family farm co-op many, many, many years ago. It is now a giant operation. And maybe you can talk about uh, what, what they're doing now. Yeah, um, very different from what's depicted in those photos. Um, so we've been doing some work for a few years now um, <laughs> in Oregon, um, kind of advocating against these two what we call mega dairies that are operating in the eastern part of the state. Um, these are the, some of the largest dairies in the country. I think they are the largest dairy in the country. And, uh, and so then by extension in the world. Um, and we learned in the course of that advocacy that they, these facilities, one of these facilities was supplying milk to Tillamook. And as a matter of fact, um, Tillamook was sourcing the majority of its milk from one of these operations um, that does not at all meet the uh, you know, images portrayed here in their advertising. And so we filed a suit um, on behalf of consumers who had purchased the product, you know, with the um, belief that their advertising was accurate. Um, and I think it's, we've heard from tons of our members and not even from our members, just members of the public. Um, it's Judy about, Zags all over Yeah, again. <laughs> like on a nationwide scale, mm -hmm. um, just about how they were deceived by these ads and how, you know, they would, they <clears> really, <throat> It's a very kind of trusted brand in Oregon, and um, they would have never purchased the products had they known. So yeah, it's very exciting, and we're just getting started. We're just um, in the motion to dismiss phase now. So uh, yeah, it will continue unfolding over 2020. Yeah, that'll be an interesting one to watch for sure, um, and how they how they square um, selling people a product based on images like this. When uh, you can go online, you can see pictures of this uh, mega, you know, dairy CAFO, as they're called, confined animal feeding operation, aka factory farm, mm -hmm. in eastern Oregon, and uh, see that this is not how things are going there. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's another way that uh, you know we can uh, use the law to challenge uh, industries that are harming animals and um, focus on. Uh, you, we sometimes have to be oblique, but these things have impacts. You know, the, these companies are making money off of these products. And uh, frankly, modern animal agriculture is a business model based on animal cruelty. Um, it's almost unavoidable the way they do business now. Um, and that has to change. And the only way it's going to change is, is if it becomes uh, too costly to do that. Um, and so 
you know, this is a way for, for us to try and level the playing field. Ultimately, hopefully people will have uh, plant-based alternatives uh, to, to choose from um, and their costs will come down because they're not competing with, uh, with a heavily subsidized industry. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. Uh, we will, uh, there are many other ways we're looking at the challenge animal ag, and that's uh, no small statement. I know you and your team have lots of meetings looking for creative <laughs> ways uh, to help animals on factory farms. Um, but we do have uh, other things that I mentioned. The second focus for us has been uh, uh, captive wildlife in roadside zoos. So we'll switch to that topic. Um, this is uh, these photos are from a zoo. I think we're going to talk about quite a bit as a uh, sort of a poster child for uh, uh, captive wildlife parks. Um, this is Cricket Hollow Zoo, which is in Iowa, and um, we had uh, we've had some great uh, victories uh, getting animals out of places like this into sanctuary. Um, and some of them are based on a legal precedent that we set in this particular case. Mm -hmm. um, and it, what's interesting is we set that precedent fairly early on in our litigation. We've just had multiple uh, cases uh, against Cricket Hollow Zoo over, over a number of years. Um, so uh, to set the stage, and pre please uh, jump in and help me with the details, mm -hmm. but um, essentially, ALDF had had a, a theory that the Endangered Species Act, our beloved federal law that provides protections for animals that are going extinct in the wild um, and provides super protections for them to keep them from going extinct, um, that that law should also apply to members of those species who are in captivity. And uh, we believed it did. It had never been uh, used in that way. So we were really looking for an opportunity to do that. And Cricket Hollow is the first place we did that because they had tigers, uh, which are endangered species, and later lions as well, which, which were added to the endangered species list uh, during our case. So uh, we were able to get the tigers and the lions out into sanctuary through our lawsuit, as well as uh, there was an endangered lemur as well there. Um, but the zoo had upwards of 300 mm -hmm. other kinds of animals, all living in just the worst squalor you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the stench making the air un unbreathable, um, very social animals locked in small individual cages, on and on and on. Um, and I, there was a statistic about, yeah, you know, the, the, the vet care they were not providing. Yeah, do yeah, you have that? I do. I pulled it from the case. So from 2007 to 2015, so that's a eight year span. <laughs> I did write the math down. Just the numbers. <laughs> um, in an eight year span, the owners of the zoo only spent $6,300, $6,300 on veterinary care for over 300 animals which as any you know, person who cares for a companion animal knows, you could spend that just on one animal in that course of time, in that amount of time and even more. Um, and then from 2015 until the time of our most recent trial, which just concluded last week, which we'll talk about in a second, um, they didn't spend anything on veterinary care at all. Their vet just didn't treat any of the animals at the facility. And then so in comparison to what a facility of this size should be spending, if it were properly caring for their animals, in that same period of time, they would have spent over three million if they had been actually providing veterinary care. So it's a really extreme example of just the value and cruelty that takes place at facilities like this. Neglect, yeah. you know, it, it's it's generally not uh, <clears throat> you know cruelty in terms of uh, aggravated right. you know cruelty, though that happens too. Um, but it's just you know absolute neglect, uh, not providing water, not cleaning up uh, cages, mm -hmm. giving uh, poor food, and then not providing vet care for wounds mm -hmm. and stuff. And we see this um, unfortunately all across the country. These kinds of places are spread out all over the country. Um, some of them charge money to visit and so forth, and they're really emblematic of the hodgepodge of very poor and weak laws uh, covering trade in wild animals. It is so easy to go and buy these large wild animals and then stick them in small cages in mm -hmm. people's backyards. Um, in, in some states, there's virtually no regulations. Um, so that's something that needs to change. It's part of the bigger picture. 
But meanwhile, um, you know, we have a tool that we're using yeah. to go after some of these places. And uh, so we won on the um, on the Endangered Species Act cases, got the endangered species out. Right. Um, and then we also, one of the problems was this zoo had had multiple uh, write-ups by the USDA, which oversees these kinds of places um, for animal cruelty, multiple Animal Welfare Act violations. Uh, and nevertheless, year after year after year, renewed their permit to operate, no challenge. So there was really no consequence. They weren't mm -hmm. finding them, they, they were renewing their permit. Um, so that was another lawsuit we filed, mm -hmm. was uh, we filed a uh, suit against the USDA um, claiming that their, uh, their rubber stamping of renewals was, uh, was an invalid process. Right, and we won that as well. So it's kind of a, as awful as this facility is, it's provided a lot of great precedent for animals, not only there, but in other facilities as well. And this is one of them that the USDA, when it's renewing licenses for facilities like this under the Animal Welfare Act, it can't, like you said, just rubber stamp them without actually examining whether they are in compliance with the Animal Welfare Act, which does set some very minimal standards for animals in captivity. Um, so as a result of that, the uh, now going forward at this facility and others, well, this one shut down now, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but at other facilities, they, you know, the USDA does actually have to make sure that they're complying with the law before they um, renew their license. Um, and so I think as a result of that, the USDA actually took action against the facility on its own and revoked um, the permit for some of the animals. And so after we had those two um, victories and were able to get the endangered species out, we followed up most recently with a nuisance suit that basically said because of the rampant animal neglect, which violates the state's um, animal cruelty law, the facility itself constitutes a public nuisance. And so just, was it last week? A yeah. lot of victories last week. A couple week. of days ago, yeah. Yeah. Um, we won that. We held there. We held a trial in uh, Iowa that actually involved the judge who was presiding over the trial making a site visit to the facility and making findings on the record just from her own observations of how deplorable the conditions really were and, like you said, the smell and just animals so clearly um, suffering and in distress. And so the judge really understood that about this facility. Um, and ordered that all of the animals be rehomed to sanctuaries. And then we had another small victory after that huge victory because the defendants in the case, the zoo, immediately um, moved to stay that order so that the animals would stay in place while they appealed. And the Supreme Court of the state um, decided against the stay. So we're able, we have attorneys there right now um, Rescuing animals. Yeah, yeah, coordinating the release, like literally right now, yeah. starting yesterday, yeah. um, all 300 plus animals uh, are going to sanctuary. So really incredible. it's been a years long battle, but to finally put them out of business. And they also ordered that they cannot own right. animals again. So <clears throat> this is the final, the final nail. Mm -hmm. um, and so based on the Endangered Species Act precedent we set, we were able to then go out mm -hmm. to many other similar roadside zoos that had endangered species in them and file lawsuits. And, and frankly, as I recall, some of the places we, you, under the Endangered Species Act, you have to first send a notice of uh, your intent to sue. Mm -hmm. And some of these places, when they got that, just basically waved the white flag and, and gave up the animals that they had. Because right. there's, you know, there's not a lot of recourse at this point um, once you win that precedent if the animals are not being cared for well. Right. Yeah, I wrote some of those down too. We have a lot, so it's hard to keep track of all the names and places, but we did that. We've used this precedent at Forever Wild in Minnesota, uh, Deer Haven Mini Zoo in Maryland, Farmers Inn in Pennsylvania, Olympic Game Farm in Washington, and then most recently Special Memory Zoo in Wisconsin. So we're definitely, oh, right. these are some of the more recent ones. Um, but yeah, we're definitely Tanya Tucker. using it. Uh, yeah, um, for, with yeah, memories. with special memory zoo. Yeah, yeah, she's she's very enthusiastic about that. That's yeah. exactly. We should say too, even if you're not trying to take it, <laughs> we have um, a place on our website where our members or just members of the public can report what they're finding at, at um, roadside zoos around the country because that's part of the problem. Is you know we don't always know that these facilities exist or what's happening there, so we really rely on our members and members of the public to let us know. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, if you go to our website, um, I don't know what the exact URL is, but if you go to aldf.org and you type into the search bar uh, roadside to form, I think you will get that. And it's basically something you can print, print out and it has all the sort of things to look for if you go to any of these places and check the boxes if you see them. And then uh, you can scan or email or fax that in and uh, we can take a look um, and we really appreciate that. Because a lot of these cases have come through mm -hmm. citizen activism um, and that's how we become aware of them. So um, yeah, thank you for being eyes and ears out there. Um, so, and the, just a quick note, I thought, um, you, you know, this uh, Cricket Hollow, the final case, uh, was filed under a nuisance law, mm -hmm. and we've we've seen some some good possibilities coming out of using state nuisance laws. For example, we were able to shut down a slaughterhouse in Florida uh, by using a nuisance law because of the activities there violated uh, community standards and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, more recently, um, maybe not more recently before that. We were able to um, <clears throat> get the state of Oregon to include uh, animal cruelty as a predicate for filing a nuisance claim so that if there are animals being treated cruelly on a property um, in the neighborhood, you can actually uh, potentially address that. So it's a really important tool um, for you know, potential litigation. And it would be an interesting thing to look into what your states or communities nuisance laws allow and what kinds of uh, cases have happened there. Um, because we get a lot of frustration when people call in and there is an animal you know, tied up to a tree, a dog tied up to a tree or uh, an animal caged in, in a way that's, that's uh, cruel, um, but it's not illegal uh, you know, specifically or you can't get animal control to take action or those sorts of things. Um, so there are more and more tools available for things like that. Um, another interesting case uh, that came up this year is puppy laundering. And this sounds like uh, the punchline to some kind of a joke, uh, actually, um, or else we just like our puppies really clean. Um, but in fact, what we're talking about are efforts uh, by unscrupulous puppy mills to uh, launder the puppies they are breeding uh, through nonprofits. And they're doing this because um, California is the first state to pass a statewide ban on the sale of puppy mill puppies. Um, and so uh, puppies have to come from the nonprofit rescue groups. And so the way they're getting around this, we found out, um, this came about through an investigation done by our, uh, our friends at, uh, uh, what's it called? Bailing Out Benji. Bailing Out Benji, thank you. Um, Bailing Out Benji that uh, did a little investigation because they were very suspicious about a Southern California pet store um, selling lots of, you know, the same kind of uh, purebred puppies, mm -hmm. claiming they were all rescues, right. um, highly unlikely. Um, so in, indeed, we were able to track down where they came from, which was uh, somewhere in Ohio. Um, and there were a couple of, uh, of rescues there. Um, the rescues were called uh, Bark, Bark Adoptions mm -hmm. and Rescue Pets Iowa. Um, and these were organizations that sprang up all of a sudden after California passed its law um, and were essentially taking puppies from puppy mills calling them rescues, adding their stamp and, and getting them sold. Mm -hmm. um, so we filed a lawsuit against both uh, Animal Kingdom and the, the pet store that was selling them in California and also both uh, Bark Adoptions and Rescue Pets Iowa um, to stop that process. And I'm happy to say that as a result of our legal work, uh, it got noticed from the Iowa AG and uh, they are now investigating these things as well. Um, so, and the store went out of business. And the store went out of business. Litigation. Yeah. So we're hoping to set a, send a message that uh, we will be watching. And uh, because more and more, I think there's uh, Chicago and um, Atlanta, Atlanta, Philadelphia. Okay. So some cities are really mm -hmm. taking up uh, bans on uh, puppy mill dogs. And, I'm, I imagine that most of the audience knows what puppy mills are, but essentially, uh, if you think of factory farms churning out puppies for sale, 
uh, that's essentially what we're talking about. You know, vast areas where uh, mother dogs are kept in cages, typically outdoors and, and with wire under their feet and are just used as breeding machines, churning out puppies. Um, and not only is it horrific for the mother dogs and the puppies, but the puppies are often sick because they're not well cared for. They're often taken from their mother too soon. Um, and so heartbreaking, heartbroken families will adopt them and wind up with very, very sick dogs on their hands as well. Um, so we're happy that there is movement towards solving that, uh, that scourge. Mm -hmm. That's um, a whole other set of our lawsuits too <laughs> that we won't even get into, but um, you know, suing for that fraud of representing animals as healthy when they're not. And right, they should right. Be when they're sold. Right. Lots of work to do. So um, let's see, uh, wanted to talk about, um, if you see me looking down here, it's because I have all kinds of like cheat sheets <laughs> taped down here because otherwise I'll forget what I was gonna talk about um, because there's so much and we really had to like limit, like what can we focus on? Um, we had a really, really big year. It was a very, very exciting year. Um, but I did wanna talk about, so, you know, up to now we've been talking about uh, a small part of our legislative or litigative work. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we have a great litigation team in house. Um, I'm also happy to uh, to say that it's backed up by a very robust pro bono network that we've built. Um, last year alone, uh, law firms that were generous enough to join our pro bono network donated more than 4.5 million dollars worth of uh, pro bono labor to us. And we're able to do a lot more legal work for animals with their help. So I can't thank them enough if any of you are watching. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we love you guys. Um, and we hope to continue to build that. Um, but most of the cases, the big cases, are generated by um, the, the very large brain people who are in our litigation program um, and meet together and come up with these fantastic ideas. Um, but sometimes we can farm out some of the work, research, and even sometimes litigating the cases, which is great. Mm -hmm. But I want to shift and talk just a little bit about legislation. Um, this is another way that we uh, approach the law, of course. This is um, uh, going to legislators or city councils or um, on and on to pass laws to protect animals. So this is creating statutory law, uh, as most of you probably know. And there's been all sorts of, uh, of state laws primarily that are being passed. Um, and some interesting ones at uh, the state and or the uh, city and county level too. Um, but for example, just in California in the past year, there was a ban on fur sales. Um, there's been a wild circus, uh, wild animal circus ban, uh, ban on bobcat hunting. And a really interesting one, there was a lot of debate on um, banning uh, what they call second gener generation rodenticides. And these are essentially rat poisons uh, that are being sold to consumers as if they're you know, a relatively harmless consumer product. Um, when in fact, what we're finding is uh, wildlife rescue groups are finding extraordinary amounts of these poisons um, in wildlife, uh, bobcats, mountain lions, foxes, coyotes, and uh, birds of prey. Um, sometimes with fatal results, but often with uh, making them weak, uh, more vulnerable, and so forth. Um, because of course, what happens is when the rats are poisoned, if these aren't used in, in you know the right way, then the rats are eaten by these other birds who are then poisoned again. It creates this chain of poisoning. Um, so uh, we're we are arguing for a ban. There was a ban a few years ago that made it only for professionals to use, and that did not cut down on the wildlife. Uh, uh, fatalities that we're seeing. So hopeful um, that that passes uh, the governor's desk. Um, and then, of course, we've been fighting. Uh, we worked hard on legislation in California a few years ago. Many of you might have heard of in the wake of Blackfish to ban uh, Orca Acts in California. And that passed. And happily, uh, there will be no more imports uh, or breeding of orcas for entertainment and they're not allowed to be used in, uh, in orca shows. So uh, we want to do the same thing in Florida. So there's been a, uh, a bill introduced every year. It's a little more controversial there, so it has not passed yet, but that's something we'll be pursuing as well. Um, and a lot of the legislative work, I have to say, we, we are, you know, I personally, I've, I've been, 
I've been at ALDF 20 years now, a uh, long time, and uh, ALDF itself is celebrating its 40th year uh, this year, so I've been here for half of the ALDF's life, uh, which is remarkable to me. Um, but you know, one of the things that I've seen happen that's really important is how much better animal organizations, uh, animal protection organizations are collaborating and working together more effectively. Um, and we really see that in legislation. There's a large coalition of groups um, that, that talk about legislation, what's coming out, what should we focus on, and that makes us a much more powerful force um, in confronting bad legislation and also being able to push good legislation. Um, Prop 12 in California, uh, which was a ballot initiative, uh, we had, that was a total coalition effort that we were a part of um, and set some of the strongest uh, farmed animal protection laws uh, anywhere, really, uh, in, in California that will go into effect over time. Um, and that was a campaign led by the Humane Society of the United States um, that uh, we and many other groups were part of. Um, another program that does some uh, fantastic work uh, is our criminal justice program. And this is our program that's devoted to uh, essentially animal cruelty laws in, that are within the criminal justice realm. Um, and our strategy in working in that area is to, to train and assist. Um, so we work with existing uh, organizations like the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys and set up trainings. We will go anywhere in the country because animal cruelty cases have a very special way they need to be handled, the way evidence needs to be handled, the way they need to be investigated, um, what you need to prove a case and all that. So we're trying to make sure that when there's an animal cruelty case, uh, the, the police, the forensic investigators, and the prosecutor all have the best possible information to make the strongest possible case. Um, and then we will help them for free. So we will do a lot of that work for them for free with our expertise. Um, and one a couple of interesting things I wanted to call out that our, our amazing criminal justice team has done this year um, one is uh, they're putting together farmed animal prosecution guides. Um, as I mentioned, there are some states that do not exempt farmed animals from state cruelty laws, uh, but in those states, a lot of the prosecutors don't realize that they can uh, prosecute farmed animals because they've never done it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're showing them how and the particulars of, of uh, how to gather evidence and do those sorts of things. Um, so we're going to roll those out to every state in the country, ultimately. Um, and then a really, really big thing was something we wanted to do for years, uh, the missing link in that training law enforcement, forensic people and prosecutors uh, is judges who ultimately decide these cases. And there was, no, uh, there was no training going on directed specifically at judges so that we could, I'm told my battery's running low, um, so hopefully that won't be a problem. Um, and, uh, these, you know, getting to judges is kind of a holy grail almost. Um, and we were able to partner with an organization called the National uh, Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, um, who allowed us to piggyback on trainings they were doing for judges, and they loved it. I was told by uh, Laura Dunn, who's our criminal justice program director, and was there for that, she said, they started off by all talking about their companion animals. Mm -hmm. um, and that just turned into this as, as, you can, as probably happens to all of us, uh, <laughs> out come the pictures. And, um, and she said, it set a really good tone. Everybody was, uh, was laughing and they, they took it really seriously. So we're now producing a bench book, which is a book for judges to have on their bench um, that has a lot of these particulars. It's, it's a big step. Um, I'm gonna see if you can find a plug for a surface. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, we don't wanna <laughs> like, if we, yeah, if we blink out all of a sudden, uh, that's why. Um, so uh, what else? Did wanna to touch uh, briefly on the work we do in the uh, legal realm because, uh, well, this was a program that was near and dear to me, um, one that I started almost 20 years ago. And uh, uh, it was, there we go. Um, what I started was to get students in law schools uh, organized to form chapters of ALDF and then to be able to do work and educate their fellow students and, and uh, 
uh, also the faculty at the school in animal uh, law issues and so forth. And it's just blown up. You know, we've got a, a student chapter in almost every accredited law school in the country now, over 200. Um, I do want to give a shout out to uh, Florida A&M University and also the American University Washington College of Law chapters. Uh, they were our two chapters of the year this year. So thank you very much for being awesome. <laughs> um, and uh, really to all of the solid people, I, I am eternally grateful. Um, it's not like being a law student uh, is an easy life with tons and tons of free time. And so the fact that you're devoting uh, some of your legal time to uh, educating people about animal issues. So we left off talking about the criminal justice program and the amazing uh, new things it's it's accomplished, uh, particularly with training judges, which we're very excited about. Um, and uh, from there, oh, we, we left that, didn't we? We're talking about... Um, two different slides now. Legal education. Oh, yeah, we gave our shout out. To we law did schools. to the law schools and to the ones that uh, won this year. And I also want to say, you know, there's some, there's been real growth in uh, animal law education um, beyond what uh, ALDF is doing. I think the Animal Legal Defense Fund was kind of been a pioneer through our chapter program and then through funding classes. And then uh, ultimately having our, our wonderful partnership with Lewis and Clark Law School, the Center for Animal Law Studies, which uh, has just taken things to a whole new level um, with uh, uh, its programs and clinic and the first ever dean of animal law, Pam Frosch. And we're so proud of the work we've, we've done with CALS. Um, and now there are programs, uh, animal law programs, opening up a pretty substantial one at Harvard. Uh, Yale, uh, Denver University, uh, really some amazing stuff happening in that world. And uh, so there's going to be, just this year, uh, there will be a new farmed animal focused clinic that will be run by the amazing Delcy Winders, who is uh, extraordinarily talented and has many years of experience litigating animal law cases. And uh, also one at uh, Harvard, which will be uh, run by Marianne's, uh, sorry, um, by uh, Kathy Myers, uh, who is another extremely experienced animal and environmental law litigator. So really some exciting things happening in the law schools in general, and we have our own plans. We plan to do, be, be doing more webinars, uh, most of them with cords to plug in the machines, I promise, uh, but we will be doing more of this. And uh, what else? The Animal Law Conference was a success. There's some photos from this year. Uh, down on the left, that's uh, Congressman Earl Blumenauer, um, who is a powerhouse uh, and uh, was came and gave us a really great, great talk. He's a big friend of animals um, and carries a lot of weight in Congress, uh, disillusioned, as are most of us, about the slow pace of getting things done there. Um, and uh, with that, I want to wrap it up. Uh, it seems like a good time to ship, ship gears, and I would love to hear your questions for me or Christina. Um, and before I do that, I just want to say uh, thank you. Uh, many of you who are listening are likely um, you know, supporters of ALDF in some way, maybe donors, maybe your pro bono um, helpers. You might be uh, SOLDF uh, student ALDF chapter members. Um, and really all of you help make our work possible. Um, we simply couldn't do any of the work that we've talked about uh, or be looking at 2020 with any hope of doing more if it wasn't for your support and your donations and so forth. So for those of you who are uh, thinking about year-end giving, um, I hope you've seen that uh, we are a, a, a very tenacious legal organization um, and making some really significant things happen. Um, and I hope you will consider us in that. We also have some cool merchandise, you know, if you're doing the Christmas shopping. Um, we have some, some really fun new designs. You can find those online. If you go to aldf.org and pull down the drop down menu, menu you just click shop and uh, you will see all of that there. Should have some ALDF branded power cords. There you go. There you go. And then, and then, and then I should buy one. Um, so uh, with that, 
I think we'll we'll take questions. And Priscilla, you're going to feed us the questions you're getting. I will. I will. Thank you all. So the first question is from Kathy. She wants to thank you both for all you do. And her question is, uh, with how are climate change and global warming issues, will our legislation be geared uh, or garnered and more focused on providing protections to expand current law? So what will our part as Animal Legal Defense Fund be uh, to petition the government for humane and crucial protections from climate issues that we will all face and are currently facing? That's a great question. Um, and I think there's, uh, you know, there's a number of different uh, answers to that. The mo probably the most on point is that ALDF has already filed a lawsuit um, specific to climate change. Um, and it's an interesting case. Uh, so we are making an argument that has not been made in its form before. And we are arguing that essentially the federal government is, um, taking away our, a fundamental right that Americans have through the Constitution to privacy or a right to be let alone, one might say, um, which in, in, much, in many laws and in many uh, writings uh, leading to the founding of this country was recognized as being a necessary part of having a right to be let alone um, and to sort of choose your own destiny. And we're losing wilderness, uh, we're losing wild places at a very rapid rate. Um, and one of the keys to that and, and the outlook is pretty, is pretty grim for those places with climate change. And part of the problem is that as uh, you know, climate change comes, it's having impacts on the wild animals that live in these places. Um, so it's also what we're trying to do would protect the homes of what wildlife we have left in the natural homes to make sure that they have a survivable habitat. And that's really what we're asking for is a, a level of protection that's higher than most of what has been asked. Um, it just so happens, to, to put it really plainly, humans are very adaptable technologically and otherwise we are very, very adaptable. We can kind of push our environments around to live in um, whereas wild animals, you know, they, they can be very, very uh, affected by even small changes in the environment or climate. Uh, you know, a, a, a flower blooming a week earlier can cause a bird that, that, that gets there uh, too late to eat them, to, to start to starve, those sorts of things. Very subtle variations can be problematic. Um, so what we're calling for is, is an environment that can provide a stable habitat for uh, the wildlife out there. So we're, we're, it's, it's actually very much a wildlife focused uh, lawsuit. But another way, and this is where it ties into uh, animal agriculture, is we're also saying our, our government lavishes subsidies on animal agriculture, um, both direct and indirect subsidies. And by doing so, it's essentially propping up this industry, helping it to grow bigger, um, all the while in full realization of all of the environmental and animal impacts. And so um, our climate change lawsuit is calling on the government, uh, insisting that it must take action because it must protect our constitutional rights. Um, and uh, in doing so, these are the industries that it needs to cut back on supporting and it needs to put some money into uh, essentially rewilding some areas. So. Um, you know, it's, it's a big ask, it's an interesting ask, but uh, we spent a lot of time on it. It's been reviewed by constitutional law professors um, who like its arguments. Um, it'll be a tough one, but I hope you'll get behind us. And, uh, and you know, coming up with these lawsuits takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, people don't realize sometimes when, uh, you know, they give us money and they want to see these lawsuits happen is how long they can take. I mean, maybe yeah. you can speak to sort of the lifespan of a lawsuit. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, it feels sometimes like just getting to the stage of filing a complaint is a victory in and of itself because it takes so much work to get there. But certainly with the environmental suits and our other suits too, you really have to build, you know, the record that will lead to a successful lawsuit. So you have to do a lot of investigation about what's actually happening to animals or what a facility is actually discharging or how much resources they're using and things like that. So that takes 
up a huge amount of time and resources just to build the case and file it. And then once it's filed, that's really just the start of the process in terms of its lifespan in court. Um, so, you know, after we follow the suit, some of our cases, we need to see through trials. We, you know, follow through with them on appeal and then when they go back down to the court where they originated. Um, and all the while it requires expert help and travel and um, lots of, again, time and resources. And these cases can be really intense. And, you know, as I think we tried to explain with some of the cases that we highlighted, we really are committed to seeing them through. So. One, you know, if we file a lawsuit, we need to know that we have the um, the ability to to see it through until its very end, um, for until we achieve success for animals. Um, and a lot of times, like our Tillamook suit is a great example. We're up against very well-funded, well-resourced um, defendants who fight very hard and don't give up easily. Um, so it really requires us um, to yeah pursue cases for years on end and fight very hard to win. Yeah. Yeah, and, and just one more thought on the, the particular question on climate change. Um, you know, there are other ways uh, we can look at that. For example, a couple of years ago, LDF filed a uh, petition to the California Air Resources Board um, because the board had uh, begun to regulate methane emissions, and methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas that traps a lot of heat in the atmosphere. Um, and they were looking at um, most of the industrial releases of methane that were happening, but they were completely exempting um, one of the largest sources in California, which is the dairy farms um, in Central California, which release enormous amounts of methane. And they not only weren't gonna regulate them, but we're not even trying to measure what that might be, though it's estimated to be by far the largest source. Um, and uh, sadly, initially, they, they sort of agreed with us, uh, but then it went nowhere. Um, and uh, so that, you know, but that's another avenue that can be pursued on these things. Well, and you mentioned two um, subsidies for the factory farm industry. So that's another case that we have right now challenging the Farm Service Agency, which lends, I want to say billions, but it may be just very many millions of dollars to the factory farm industry. And our lawsuit alleges that the government does that without considering the environmental impacts of that industry expanding, and specifically with regard to climate change. So it doesn't consider how these facilities in the aggregate or individually contribute to all of the problems that we're seeing. So we are tackling it in a few ways already. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, we have a lot. Um, so Annette is asking, in your opinion, what are the top three uh, animal welfare laws you're working with, which will have the most impact for animals? Um, and not only laws, but areas of interest. So she cites personhood or animal cruelty laws applied to capos as examples. Well, we can highlight one. I don't know if, if you want me okay, to answer sure. quickly. Um, we are litigating right now against the USDA for rescinding a rule that it had issued that would protect animals who are raised on factory farms in the organic industry. So that would have been the first um, federal law that actually regulated nationwide how animals are treated on the factory farm versus just at the slaughterhouse. Um, and so after over a decade of hearings and administrative process, the um, National Organic Standards Board finally issued regulations that would guarantee some kind of minimum standards of care for animals on factory farms. And then once um, the new USDA took over, they rescinded the rule. And so we're actually involved in litigation right now to challenge that, but that is one area where, I mean, it would definitely be a first. It would be the first nationwide legislation that actually governs uh, or not legislation, sorry, uh, agency regulation that actually um, guarantees a standard of care for animals on factory farms. So that's one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned, um, uh, or the whoever asked mentioned um, state cruelty laws, and I would say that is still sort of the vanguard uh, law that uh, that we use. Um, we have to often be creative about how we can apply it, especially to applying it in, to circumstances beyond just the usual cat and dog uh, companion animal cases that get brought by the prosecutors. And we've had some, some success in doing that. Um, and I think it's, it's a, you know, over time, 
um, you know, through using the law in unique ways, we'll be able to expand the boundaries. Uh, one example, as I noted earlier, is our criminal justice program has put together a uh, prosecutor's guide for prosecuting farm animal cases. And that would be a pretty avant-garde thing to have going on. Um, but that resource is out there. And we have interested prosecutors who really did not know they could do that. Um, so that could have tremendous impact uh, in, because most, you know, most state cruelty laws, while they're maybe not best and they're not necessarily requiring um, the best possible care, you know, they provide a floor that's at least reasonable. Um, and it's rather appalling that uh, industries like factory farming can't even meet that, that low bar. Um, so I think calling them to account, I think, Animal cruelty laws are very popular with the public. I think it would be very hard uh, if you get that in the public domain to have uh, the industry try and argue why it needs exemptions from cruelty laws if it cares as much as it says it does about uh, treatment of animals, et cetera. I think that's very powerful. Great. Thank you. Um, Diane is wondering what is the update or the current status on the Forever Wild case? Uh, she and others have been following it. And so are there any updates or is it still pending? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> We're on the verge of a trial, actually. Oh. Um, so we did receive a win. I don't know how when the last time this person <laughs> checked in was or when we reported on this, but we did have a win where um, the court ruled in our favor that the Endangered Species Act um, applies to all wolves, which includes wolf hybrids. Um, since uh, you know it's a it's all wolves have a little bit of kind of domestic um, dog lineage in them, and so basically for purposes of our suit, our all wolves are wolves, and so they're all protected under the Endangered Species Act, and so that was a pretty significant victory. And now we are going to trial to for the court to determine whether or not the facility actually did violate the Endangered Species Act. Oh, okay. Sorry, taking questions. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And are we, um, for the Olympic Game Farm as well, any updates on that one? <clears throat> I'm not sure the most I'm recent. Sure. I think we've already reported on the most recent status. I don't think there's any changes since we last announced it. <laughs> All right, and then um, there is another case update. Uh, someone's wondering where we're at with the Fairlife case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Fairlife case is in its very early stages. We are just beginning our involvement now. Um, so actually, same on that. Unless there's something I don't know, of, we've no further developments past what we've already reported. I think. Well, and, and uh, maybe for folks that aren't familiar with those cases, we should uh, say what they are. Uh, Fairlife was a, a dairy that uh, represented itself as being, you know, a very cutting edge dairy that took really good care, kind of a la uh, Tillamook. Mm -hmm. um, you know, showed people very hands on care for animals and so forth. And um, undercover investigations went in there and found um, all kinds of animal abuse, um, people punching cows and throwing or calves throwing calves, um, them being separated from their mothers, all things that uh, the industry, uh, that the place was claiming they didn't do routinely. Um, so it's very embarrassing for them. It also, of course, um, it's a brand owned by Coca-Cola, uh, Fairlight Products, that uh, uh, sells a lot of milk to people uh, with those claims. So there were two competing class action uh, lawsuits uh, that were possibly going to get filed. So it took a while after all the all the data came in uh, for the courts to rule on which of the cases would go forward. And now my understanding is there's been a ruling, and we are working with the class action firm that will will go forward with the case. Mm -hmm. um, this is likely to be a fairly lengthy case um, unless it somehow settles early. Um, but we're excited that some tangible action is being taken. Uh, given the nature of what happened there. And once again, you know, we see an industry that uh, thinks nothing of uh, duping consumers. And, uh, um, you know, their whole industry is based on uh, abusing animals and hiding their abuse of animals, really, and subsidies. Like, I, I, I'm oversimplifying, obviously, but 
Um, but that's really sort of three absolutely necessary uh, things for them to operate. Thank you for that update. Tim is wondering, um, could you chat about any examples where public records requests have been particularly helpful? So Christina, you might be able to, you probably have like a laundry list of, of <laughs> when FOIA was helpful, but I'll leave you to it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, is really one of our most powerful tools. And I should say state public records acts mm -hmm. as well that entitle us to receive information from the government about how it's doing its job and the entities that it regulates. Um, so one example is that case that I just mentioned where we're suing um, the Farm Service Agency for lending money to factory farms without doing any environmental analyses, that analysis. Um, that case is a direct result of FOIA requests that we filed asking for documentation about how the agency considers environmental impacts when lending. And the response to that request revealed that um, they're not doing <laughs> any analysis. And so that you know enabled us to file suit. We use the Freedom of Information Act, um, something called the Reading Room a lot, um, which is USDA used to post mm -hmm. um, inspection reports under the Animal Welfare Act, which we mentioned earlier with regard to Cricket Hollow Zoo. That's how we um, get on the ground evidence. That's one of the ways that we get on the ground evidence about what's happening at zoos is from these inspection reports. USDA used to post them online and uh, we actually sued when they decided to take those reports down. Um, and so that's one really powerful way of obtaining information. And I should say we won that lawsuit. Um, so USDA has to uh, continue post making those publicly available um, under FOIA. And we use those inspection reports to build all of our cases against roadside zoos. Um, we use them, I'm trying to think of other ways. We use actually FOIA itself as a, as a vehicle to advance animal rights under the law. So we had a suit, um, we filed records requests with USDA related to Tony, who was a tiger who was um, held captive at a, I believe it was a truck stop. Um, and he was very clearly suffering and um, at, at risk of death from his ailments and being neglected. And so we um, submitted records requests asking for records about him. And we asked for USDA to expedite the request, meaning you know, to respond to us more quickly because his life was in danger. And um, we specifically argued that Tony was an individual under the terms of FOIA. Um, USDA would not expedite the request because they basically said an animal cannot be an individual under FOIA. And so we sued them um, for that kind of character characterization um, or interpretation of FOIA. And we pursued that case all the way up to the Ninth Circuit and argued before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that you know animals are individuals under FOIA, and so we've even used the you know terms of the statute itself in addition to the records that we obtain as a way of um, yeah seeking justice for animals. So FOIA is an incredibly important tool. Absolutely. Uh, so we are just about out of time. If you uh, wanted to have any final last words about 2019 or a peek into 2020. Well, um, we're working <laughs> on our plans for next year. A lot of uh, a lot of the work that we'll do would obviously be considering. We have, uh, just in litigation, we have like 62 suits, I think, that are active. <laughs> so, um, you know, a lot of our work will be continuing to muster those through. Um, I know one big thing that we're hoping to do on the legislative side, uh, if any of you are in New York, um, this will be our second year full push to get uh, Bella's bill passed. And Bella's bill is a law to strengthen aspects of New York's cruelty law, which ranks very poorly um, in, in our US rankings. Uh, and we will, as soon as the, the legislature in New York starts back up in January, we'll be pushing to pass Bella's bill, which will essentially, bizarrely, uh, New York's animal cruelty law is housed in its ag and agriculture and market section of its law, um, long side things like, you know, what makes uh, a legal potato to sell and, you know, those sorts of things. 
um, and uh, it belongs in the penal code like other criminal laws. Um, and this would make some significant significant changes in how law enforcement prosecutors and the whole criminal justice system is trained in animal cruelty laws. And that's a big problem in New York right now. Um, so we're pushing that. And I hope uh, those of you in New York will, will speak to your legislatures about that. Stay tuned. And uh, stay tuned on all of our work. Um, if you go to ALDF.org, you can sign up for our newsletters. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, and sign up for, uh, subscribe to, to us on Facebook and thereby keep track of the cases you heard about and many, many others. Um, we really, really appreciate your support, both writing letters, um, supporting us with uh, your, your, your dollars, uh, keeps us working, um, and also uh, just being active, you know, being active. Make sure your legislators know who you are and you care about animals. That really makes a difference, all those sorts of things. So thank you very much, and uh, we hope you enjoyed this. We are sorry for the lights out glitch in the middle of it. Um, so thank you to those of you who stuck with us. Thank you so much, Steve and Christina. And we are very, very uh, looking forward to seeing all of you on our 2020 webinars. We have, as I said at the beginning, a lot in store. So stay tuned and we'll see you in the new year. Until then, happy holidays and um, hug those fur babies of yours. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, Christina. And sorry we weren't able to get to all the questions, but my email box is always open, prader at aldf.org if you do have any follow-up questions. Thanks and talk to you later. Thank you. Bye.